A quarter to two, time to start. Welcome back from, from lunch, everybody. And of course, thank you for joining in and participating in this session. Thank you very much also to AX Semantics for organizing this great event and for giving the opportunity to give here a masterclass. I'm Bernard Bicher, co-founder and CEO of OneDot. Why am I standing here today? I founded a company called OneDot um, six years ago um, to make product data consumable between commerce and industry. With this vision in mind, we built the first intelligent product data platform to source, onboard and distribute product data. Along the way, I actually learned a few things about um, product data and content, which I would like to pass on to you today. I'm happy to do this session interactively. So in case you have questions, um, just uh, chat, uh, write a little message on, on the chat. Um, so I'm happy to answer your questions straight away. Um, otherwise, there will be enough time at the end of the, the session to ask questions. OK. Also, after the session, feel, uh, um, feel free to reach out to me. Here are my contact details. You, of course, will find me on, on LinkedIn, on, on Twitter, or over the homepage. Otherwise, just send me an email. I'm uh, happy to, to talk to you um, bilaterally. OK, then, then let's uh, start. I want to structure the session in, in three parts. First of all, I would like to recap why content matters. I would assume that everybody is a, is a fan or sees the value of content. Um, still, I would like to, to set the, the common baseline because in the second, second part of the session, actually, we talk about how to get the basis for good content, um, which then you can take it from there. At the end, I would like to do a quick summary of the, of the key facts I would like you to take home. And of course, there will be enough time for a Q&A session. So when we talk about product data and content, of course, the question comes around, is this actually the same or is this something different? So here, a, a definition about data and content. So when we talk about data, data is really raw. It's basically just the numbers, uh, the patterns, and uh, nothing more. When you talk about content, it's a bit more. It's actually about contextualized data. So content gives you the frame or explains you how a product or a solution can help you or can relate to you. For the ones who really love uh, definitions, um, you may even think what is then the, the distinguishing to information. Some people say that information is basically interpreted data or meaningful data. But anyway, let's not get lost on definitions. Data, just the plain vanilla data, like 12 centimeters. But um, content is if you put this 12 centimeter then into a context of, of, uh, of, of for example, uh, a cupboard or uh, a lineal. So let me, let me continue on the product data side and how actually one dot uh, um, structures product data. So from our side, we see eight elements. First of all, you come across product data uh, in, in your daily life uh, when you see product titles. When you go shopping, uh, you get a receipt, right? And there's product information on, on the piece of paper. Just a little bit, but yes, that's product information. Um, you also see product uh, data or product titles when you shop, when you see the little label um, attached to a T-shirt or maybe a, a bigger, bigger device. Um, in some shops, they already have digital price tags. So also there, you see key information um, or key features of the product. Um, the same as uh, when, of course, you browse online, you have different titles. Um, the titles might, may be different if you browse it on the, on the web browser or if you go on, on a mobile where there's less space available. Um, an important topic is the synonyms. If you, if you of course, uh, have some customers who, who search for this term, uh, for this synonym, and the other ones for the other, of course, you need to make sure that both people come, come to the same product at the end. right? The second element are the product attributes. Um, here are the technical specification, right? For example, um, the, the, the screen diagonal of, 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 a, of a laptop or the material of a T-shirt, the color or size. Um, and you use them just to understand what the product is about. But um, of course, these attributes can also be used for filters and also for comparison. If you want to compare products regarding features, it's very helpful, of course, if you have these uh, possibilities available. 
Then let's continue with the images. Images, of course, are, are pretty important, especially for some categories like in fashion. Um, then it's important that you can offer different views of the picture. Is it just from the front, from the back, from the side, from the bottom, whatever is relevant. Um, and if you're in fashion or in equipment, then um, sometimes you have it just a T-shirt, for example, and sometimes you have it with a model. And it's the same with product or with a device. Sometimes you just see the product and sometimes you want to see it in action when you, for example, um, uh, want to buy a drill. Number four, the descriptions. And here, from my point of view, we're moving a bit more towards content because uh, this text will, um, will tell you how uh, this product can help you. Um, here are different kinds of descriptions. You normally have a short description and a long description. Sometimes you have selling points, which is just summarizing why you should actually buy this product. And for more advanced products, you sometimes even have buying guidelines. For example, if you want to buy an e-bike, then you find a buying guideline may be quite helpful because if you're new in the business or new for this uh, kind of product, then you're um, interested to know what you need to look for. Number five, it's about videos. Of course, here you can either have videos which just uh, demonstrate the product, um, but uh, you sometimes also have videos which are product reviews, um, where you get a critical voice on the product, um, sometimes often very helpful. Audio, if you're, for example, in the media business or book business, uh, audio books uh, or CDs and music, then it's, it's helpful to have also audio snippets or maybe even the, a longer track available so people can, can, can look at it or listen to it um, and better understand if they want to buy it. Then we also have reviews as an element of product data, um, reviews either by experts, which you may trust a bit more, and then by some, some users. But of course, user feedback can also be very valuable. Um, quite often, they are very blunt and honest. And last but not least, we have also manuals um, available, and then they often are in different languages, um, a description of how you can really use the product. I actually thought about adding a ninth element, which is then about uh, um, 3D models, especially in construction, for example. Um, companies now are interested to have a 3D model or sometimes even the, the computer-aided design, the cut and the cut uh, files there. So the buyer can really get all the, all the views of the product. Any other element I forgot from your point of view, feel, feel free to, um, to tell me. Um, but otherwise, uh, this is what we consider product data. Um, and when you have uh, these kind of product data available, then you, know, you can move forward to good content. Just to make this a little bit more uh, lively, I have here an example. Uh, I think it's pretty straightforward. We have two shops. On the left side, we have a shop where there's uh, only uh, bare information of this barbecue. And on the right side, you have a lot of uh, or you have more information. First of all, um, you have here more pictures available, right, um, from different views, so you can really see how, how this, uh, this barbecue is, is, a, is like. Then you have here um, the product data, uh, the technical specifications, um, the size, the, the weight, um, and then here you have a description which will help you to understand um, how you can use it um, and how, how this product can make your barbecue awesome. So I would say probably everybody agrees that uh, it's, it's uh, higher likely that the user will buy from shop number two. two. And that's, of course, where we would like to, to bring you towards to. So to talk a bit more about what is good product data, good product data has four elements, which are availability, completeness, granularity, and consistency. These, uh, these elements are actually from a white paper where, country, where one dot uh, contributed. Um, I will touch base later at the end of the presentation. But what, uh, what are these elements? Um, so I think the first one is, is pretty simple or maybe not that simple. It's about the availability. Of course, you need to have access to product data. And especially if you have multiple sources or maybe even duplicate, duplicate sources which uh, share the same content, it's important that you have one data source that provides you the product data and that this um, data source is available. 
quite often um, this functionality is taken by a PIM, a product information management system, um, but sometimes it can be the ERP or maybe you even have more sophisticated systems like PIM and a uh, media asset management system, depends on you. But anyway, it's important to have a consolidated uh, database for product data. The second topic is about completeness. Of course, it's important that the data um, is, is, is complete in the sense that um, all the product characteristics are there and you uh, are available to you or to your um, buyers and users who want to buy the product. Granularity as a third element, it's important that the information is structured. It can be that all the information is in the product description, but especially if you are uh, about uh, searching searching for information or if you uh, yeah, want to compare and you just have a product description it's for you, for you very hard to actually compare these products so granularity is definitely relevant and of course also consistency this is not just consistency within a product but also across products if for example coming back to the topic of synonyms if you have the same products in different versions but you always uh, call it differently um, then of course it's very hard that uh, the user understands this is the same here. Yeah. So for example in construction there's the Listello and the Bordure um, which are describing the same product but if you have it uh, written in different forms then of course this is hard for the user to, to see. It's of course important to know that these are synonyms because then you can uh, make this available in the search uh, because some people will search for this for the, for the one term and the other ones for the other one. There are basically more, more, more uh, elements for, for good product data. I think uh, one which is not here, but I think relevant is the timeliness. Of course, you also need to make sure that the data is always up to date. Sometimes product information is getting updated uh, by a manufacturer. Um, and of course, it's important that you then always um, get the update yourself. Any comments or questions so far? Otherwise, just a quick question to you. So um, do we all agree uh, that good content matters? Because I think that's important to move forward because if you don't believe that good content matters, then um, it doesn't make sense that I will explain you how, how you can get there. Thanks for the confirmation, Michelle. Um, happy to have you on board. Still, I would like to also summarize why good content has a financial benefit. I think also this is straightforward. If you have uh, richer content on your page, you will get a higher page rank. A higher page rank will actually make sure or will enable you to be more on top of the, of the search engines, which ultimately means that the users actually uh, will, will see you earlier and uh, you, will, you will get more traffic. Once, once the, the visitors or the searchers are actually on your site, then it's about the conversion. If you have higher content, we have seen before, then for the, pro, for, the, for the user, it's easier to find the right product, um, find the right information. Um, because if, for example, you're an online shop and you have thousands of products, it's, it can be quite a challenge actually to come to the product you're really interested in. So uh, better conversion is a result and better conversion has, of course, also a direct impact on your revenue. And I think uh, not to neglect is also the last one, higher basket size. Um, if you have a, a platform, a shop or a site which uh, is more high end, then you normally have a higher basket size, which of course also has a direct impact of revenue. And then when you do the equation, uh, traffic times conversion times average basket size, you will get the revenue you, you make. And if you play around in the Excel, um, please do so. I think you, you see how sensitive these numbers are. So if you can just uh, increase a tiny little bit the conversion or increase a little bit in the search traffic, this can result in uh, a lot of more, more uh, revenue for you. Okay, then I would like to continue with the next chapter, how to get the basis for good content. So when you're a manufacturer, then of course you would like to sell your products and merchants can be quite helpful in selling your products. And if you're a merchant or a marketplace, then you have the challenge on getting all the, the product data from the merchant and the supplier into your systems. 
And there are different channels how you can get the product data. So if you have the upper hand or if you have quite a strong market position, then you may be lucky with the merchant Excel templates. What does it mean? It actually means that you describe uh, in an Excel for, um, how you would like to have the product specification from your supplier. And then the supplier will just fill it in. Um, if you're a bit more advanced, um, you have even this online, uh, either a supplier portal where they can type in the information, or you have an API where you have the, spec um, the specification online and a clear description of what everybody needs to send. Um, quite common is, of course, that the supplier enforces uh, uh, the catalog on you. So it means that the supplier will actually just send you the catalog. Um, which is available and then it's uh, it's on you actually to onboard the data and make sure that all the product information is getting onboarded into your ERP or PIM. Um, and I'm happy to show you uh, sometimes this can be quite tricky. Uh, what, what do I have here? Uh, sometimes product catalogs come actually uh, in XML and quite often this is uh, then or um, it's then more complicated actually to to get an understanding of the completeness of, of the data quality when you're in front of an XML. Um, so what, what kind of example is this? Uh, this is actually uh, an example from Bosch, exactly. Probably everybody of you has already used a, a Bosch. And then um, there's a lot of information in, in, in here. Um, but of course, uh, yeah, you need to be able to work with such, such, uh, such a structure. And when we uh, go down to the articles, you see here all the article information. And we have here, for example, a lovely product called um, Lise Hexler um, with all the different product information and sometimes they even um, following some international standards. Here, for example, we have the, the Profi class, um, which you need to know what code means which value. So definitely um, quite a challenge. Um, and sometimes um, they, they don't even send you the catalog or let's say this is a bit more in fashion quite present where just uh, an Nike or, or Adidas just gives you access to the supplier portal and then you can download the information you want um, yourself. There's a, another option actually to work together with content providers. So content providers are companies which actually collected the data from the manufacturers and uh, make it available to you. I will just touch, uh, touch about this topic in a minute. At the end, all this information comes, comes to the merchant and the easier this information is digestible for the merchant, of course, and the better the, the, the products can be presented. Um, but yes, it's quite a burden actually to, to structure the data and make it available for um, content generation um, and the online shops. So just a quote actually by, by one, one of a large uh, electronic retailer about merchant templates. Uh, I think this is quite quite hard actually to use. So what they say is, yeah, the big ones, they don't do it. And the small ones, actually, they just don't have time for it. Um, still, I would say sometimes uh, templates ha have a value. Um, it gives some guidance actually to the manufacturer what kind of information you need. But still, um, it, it's getting harder and harder to enforce uh, templates on a supplier. Maybe another idea you had, why, why can we not have just one dominant uh, standard where this data exchange is actually made very, very simple? I let you read um, this little comic yourself. So yes, to summarize, there are already a lot of standards out there. Um, I think they're not really getting getting fewer, um, but uh, I think also a standard has a, has a complexity. As you have seen before, for example, this data format that I was showing you is following a standard, but standards are sometimes just scratching the surface because they give um, um, a rough guidance on what, what, what to structure. But then the content inside, um, you still have all the freedom um, how, um, how you want to put the content. Okay, now a few words about content providers. So there are quite a few companies out there where you can buy uh, product data or even content when we talk about uh, high quality marketing descriptions. So depending on where you are, uh, which kind of segment you're operating, you have here in the books and media uh, uh, um, segment, uh, Schweizer Buchzentrum, Libi, Phononet, we have, which have a couple of million articles, Tivo, Exrovi, oder das Verzeichnis lieferbare Bücher, uh, or KNV Zeitfracht, um, which are um, large uh, providers of product data. 
Um, then on the other side, in construction, you have a search engine build up. You have das Bad, uh, which is the SGVSB, Schweizer Großhandelsverband um, der sanitären Branche, Heizebaudatenbank. Uh, you have Nextmarkt, uh, which has about 300 uh, product catalogs um, ready to share. Or the SHK, das Sanitär, Heizung und Klimaportal. Or a bit more, um, the Verband Technischer Handel also has a data portal. In electronics, I think this is the mo most advanced uh, segment where you have large content providers like CNET and uh, ISCAD and GFK. And they claim to have over 15 million uh, of product data available in 20, 25 different languages. So definitely huge data pools uh, which you can access. Yeah. So the ISCAD open catalog is actually free to use. Um, it is a limited version, but it may be something for you to look, uh, look into. Um, all the others, of course, you need to pay. Open Data Check is another another uh, portal. This is more in electronic and electro electronic goods. Uh, you may want to check it out or X Place. Um, here I'm aware of, for example, for for games, and they have a lot of data. Food is uh, um, food is actually the the, the richest the richest uh, um, content pools available by the uh, GS1 or the GDSN uh, Net um, 30 uh, global global pools. Where you may have already used some um, One World Thing or Atrify or B Think or Trustbox in Switzerland, where you can get all the product data. And I'm also Marcant, of course, a huge player. And historically, um, because in, in food actually, it's of course extremely uh, relevant. Life depends on it. And if you have all the correct information, this is actually um, the most advanced or more standardized uh, segment. Then you have a few other ones uh, in fashion or fashion cloud or tech alliance, more in, in, in automotive and aftermarket. Um, exactly. Let me know if I forget I forgot something. There are also a few players out there, but uh, yeah, um, I think that should be the biggest one at least we came across. Then I would like to quickly touch base on content syndication. What is content syndication? I think it's an interesting concept, uh, which is currently provided by two players, CNET and Lopi, maybe some other ones. And uh, let me just show it to you what it actually means. It means that the manufacturer has directly a, a channel to your web shop and they can directly uh, put uh, content there. So it's like an external window, an iframe, which is put. And um, for example, here is a, is a, is a, is is, a, is an example of Tolineo. It's a it's a it's a shop for um, yeah for tools construction. You see here a lovely uh, uh, Scheuersaug machine um, for thirty thousand euros. And here you of course see all the description, the technical data, etc. And here you see a window manufacturer information. And when you click on this window, you see actually content which is directly injected um, by Kercher. And um, this is, as I understand, out of control of the shop. This is all described how the manufacturer wants to have it. Yeah. So it can be technical data, it can be some, uh, some uh, data sheets, it can be some videos. Um, so here a lot of uh, content is available. But of course, this is not really in your, in your online shop. It's basically just a layer on top, and, uh, which is uh, controlled by the manufacturer. Still, I think an interesting, an interesting view. Um, maybe, maybe interesting for you. Most of the customers, of course, want to have this data also in the PIM. Um, this is not available with this option, but it's an easy way to just have a, a lot of additional material on top. Yeah. I see here a question: Is it language depending? Um, if you mean this one, I, I am not an expert on, on these tools. You may want to directly speak to CNET or Lopi about it, but I would say yes. Uh, I think also each shop is, uh, has, a, has a base language behind it. And if the content or if the manufacturer actually provides you, uh, provides uh, content in different languages, then this, this should be uh, available. Okay, let me get, let me get back to the presentation. Uh, let me look at the time. We still have about 20 minutes. So far, so good. Now, when it comes to onboarding product catalogs, um, yeah, mentioned it before, or maybe you know it already, that it's quite a tedious process. So when the manufacturer is sending you different uh, catalogs, um, different formats, XML, we have seen also PDFs, 
which contain product data. Sometimes in a separate channel, they provide you the assets, the images, the PDFs, the energy efficiency labels, etc., or even uh, price and stocks. Then you need to handle all this data. Um, some customers actually are really uh, taking this man or doing manual data entry. Um, these companies have quite large teams, uh, up to 30 people we have seen. But of course, if, if the volume is high, this is not, uh, not a sustainable option. Some companies we have seen, they're just using the import functionality for, uh, from their PIM and ERP. Of course, each database actually has some import functionality. But as we have seen, um, the functionalities are there quite limited. And you have larger catalogs where there's a lot of information to map and the structure. Um, this is definitely reaching limits. Um, then the third option is middleware uh, software providers, for example, like uh, Tradebyte or Brickfox. They already have a few connections to manufacturers. So you just need to tap into this data uh, data, data feed. Um, but here, uh, quite often, the, the data is not well structured or uh, it's just a tiny part of what is available as a whole. Um, so you need to check if this is really an option for you. And last but not least, um, of course, there are dedicated onboarding software, uh, which, which are focusing on taking all the, the catalogs from the suppliers and uh, transforming it directly in the structure of the PIM and ERP. More about this a little bit later. Content provider, we talked about it. Yes, you have access to a lot of data there, but uh, the downside is uh, they are in a different structure than you, you need to use. So also these informations, actually you need to transform and map it to your structure so you can later use it for text generation or for generating content. Okay, then let me continue. I would like to show you now what a full onboarding process looks like. So if you receive a catalog from a supplier and you want to make sure that uh, the data at the end, all the articles are in high quality in your database, you basically need to run through 12 steps here. Let me, let me show you uh, what each element uh, really is about. So of course, you need to have access to the catalog. Then you need to be able to load the catalog. Um, I think uh, loading in Excel might be easier or a CSV, but as we have seen before, right? I mean, there are some XML um, structures out there. And quite often we see that manufacturers actually uh, don't uh, generate proper XML. Then you have corrupt files, or which are then uh, quite hard actually to read because uh, people didn't know how to properly generate XML. Anyway, what's next? Then, of course, for you, it's important to understand what are actually what are actually the products which are new um, by the supplier, which you don't yet have in your uh, database, versus the ones which you already have. Or um, you can even uh, understand which products are not delivered anymore by the supplier, but you still have in your database. So these are um, products which you should decommission. I think the product matching is also important for you to de-scope when we talk about content. Of course, content uh, takes effort. And if you can already uh, get rid of, for example, all the products which are not new, then you can reduce uh, the effort for, for the onboarding. Um, even, even, even on top, if you have uh, 1,000 new shoes, for example, which you can potentially uh, buy or, or source, then you may not want to have everything in your system because you're focusing on some specific models. So we recommend that uh, already outside uh, the PIM, you actually deselect these products um, so that you only import what is really relevant and you want to sell. Then we have here this topic about extraction. I mentioned it before. Some manufacturers don't really send information in a structured way. This element of granularity, definitely. Um, so you need to have capabilities either with the, with the software or just manually. Um, some data workers that you actually then extract the information and make it uh, map it to your uh, to your structure. Uh, what's next? Then we have uh, categorization. Categorization means that you need to categorize all the products from the supplier to your, categor to your category tree because you designed in your own world a way of how um, people can navigate and find an according product. And if you have a large shop and you have 1,000 categories, this can be a quite uh, difficult process. Um, there are also, oh no, not like this, like this actually, um, there are also some international classification standards which may help you or which may put even a bigger burden on you. This is a bit more on construction side, but uh, yeah, there are some E-class, E-team, Profi-class, 
United Nations Standard Products and Service Codes, GPC by the GS1, or for the fashion people in here, um, the, the FEDAS codes, which help you to understand what kind of product this is. Um, of course, there are also the tax tariffs, and this, uh, this can be easy or helpful for you if the manufacturer provides it, or maybe you're even using these classifications to structure the products on your side. Yeah. So quite a uh, big topic, categorization, um, and then even a bigger topic is the attribute mapping. This means um, if you have uh, a PIM on your side and you have defined a clear data model, how you describe products, um, how you call uh, a length, how you call a breadth, how you call the size, then you need to map all the attributes from the supplier to the naming in your database. Once you have mapped it, you also need to map a list of values, a Wertelisten, um, also this, of course, you want to have consistency, which when you later then want to generate text, then uh, it's, uh, it's definitely helpful if everything is consistent and comparable. Also here, uh, you, can, you can then take the action to generate product titles. I will just show uh, some information in a, in a minute. Translation, exactly, translating catalogs. Um, machine translation works pretty good. Still, you should validate the output or you can use dedicated resources to translate. Golden record means um, if you have the same product from different suppliers and you want to bring it together, maximum information, golden record, which you need to master, and at the end also um, product variants to generate the different variants for, uh, for a t-shirt, for a machine, for what is available, um, so you can show it to the user. And at the end, then um, the data is uh, restructured and you can import it into the PIM or into the ERP. I already talked about the classification. I just have a few more slides in this chapter left. So let me talk about the product title generation. I think this is uh, especially um, helpful if you just want to focus on, on the most important or most important one or just on the, on the basics. It's about how you can generate product titles which really are descriptive. So how it's often done actually uh, per category, you define how a product title should look like. Um, quite often it's actually the brand, the product model, and then you define uh, top attributes. What are top attributes? These are the most relevant attributes. When you look at the uh, product title, you can understand what the product is or what can the product can offer. And this is normally uh, the, your category management often knows uh, uh, what are the most important features people are looking for. It. Um, or of course, you can also analyze the competition or analyze data traffic. And now let's talk a bit more about the, the text generation. So if you want to generate more advanced text, then actually you need to use software uh, which uh, yeah, is more advanced. And uh, yeah, AX Semantics is one of these softwares. Um, what you can see here is actually a setup which is currently running for a, a fashion customer. So um, on, on one side, of course, uh, Wondo can be used to onboard the different catalogs from the, from the brands, from the suppliers, to uh, um, easily import it into the PIM. But then um, for, uh, for these customers, which doesn't uh, use a PIM, which is directly connected to AX Semantics, Wondo is jumping into the, into the yeah, uh, jumping in, and actually um, we are taking the data from, from the ERP or for the PIM, um, calling the AX Semantics API, um, AX, AX is generating the text, and then actually OneDot is generating again an import uh, file, which then uh, can be easily imported into the PIM. And like this, uh, over OneDot, um, customers uh, can also operate AX Semantics, which uh, don't have a PIM or ERP, which is directly connected to AX. Okay, questions for, for this setup? Otherwise, uh, just one last thing before we touch the summary. Um, prioritization is an important thing in general in life, but also for content, because content takes a lot of effort. So please make sure that you have a prioritization strategy. It makes sense to focus on investing into content where you can earn more money. So if you have, for example, a few tools, uh, tools uh, sticks actually um, selling online, you may don't want to spend, uh, I don't know, a couple of hours on generating a nice description for it or unique content. So invest actually in the top sellers um, and, and try to, uh, yeah, um, unique content. And for the long tail, um, definitely automated text generation or just using content from the manufacturer may be, may be enough. Yeah. Uh, measure it. I think that's a super interesting topic. Measure the impact of good content on conversion. 
Um, but of course, uh, be careful um, because if you uh, write a nice description about the sun cream today and suddenly tomorrow um, everybody's buying sun cream, it may be a reason that it's actually super sunny weather um, or the same with rain. Um, so definitely try to make sure that you don't have any external factors which are influencing your statistics. Okay, 10 minutes left. Let me summarize and then, of course, um, yeah, shoot the questions. Exactly, if you want to know more about uh, importance of data, I can only recommend you to, to download this white paper. The white paper was actually written by AX Semantics, ContentSurf, MMH, OneDot, and Riversand. And it gives you a nice uh, introduction actually on yeah on product information management why it's why it's important why good data is important and also what is uh, how this is the baseline for nat natural language generation. Okay, then the summary of the session just five points. I keep it lean. First of all, uh, good product data is the basis to generate high quality content. So if you don't have data, it's very hard for you to probably write a text or, or embed it in, into nice content. So invest first into the data part so that later on um, you can generate high quality um, content. We have seen that high quality content will boost your revenue because you'll get more traffic with a better conversion and even your basket size can uh, increase. From our point of view, it's best to source the content directly actually from the manufacturer. Why? Because the manufacturer is the owner of the products. He knows best how to describe the products. Um, yes, there are some intermediate uh, players which can also um, generate the content for you. Um, but uh, from our point of view, always try to have this connection to the manufacturer. Then software support is available. Um, yeah, if you have low volume, of course, you may be good enough on, on just the manual data ent entry or manual data preparation, but higher volumes um, use software, um, like for example, of course, OneDot, uh, self-learning software is from our point of view, uh, future-proof because it means that it, it um, learns from how you give feedback to the software. And this means that you have less and less effort actually on onboarding these catalogs. For text generation, yes, there's also software out there. Um, we are um, at the conference of one of these providers, so definitely very interesting. Um, if you have uh, a lot of text to write, um, then you should uh, have a closer look at this option. Okay, uh, just one little hint. My colleague Robin actually will do a live demo uh, about OneDot. So if you're interested uh, to learn more about how OneDot can help you on the product data side, then feel free to go to our booth actually in uh, yeah in the quarter to um, to three. And Robin will do a demo and uh, uh, answer more questions. Yeah. Here, as you can see, right, you have an overview of uh, the different onboardings which are running in, in the data platform. Um, you can supervise uh, the software is proposing, as we have seen in this onboarding process, the different the different steps. The software is proposing a categorization. The software is proposing how you do uh, how you can map attributes or how you can normalize attributes, and you um, switch from actually doing it to actually supervising and controlling the data quality. So um, feel free to pass by in our booth at. Uh, two o'clock 45. Exactly, thanks for the question. I'm just coming to the end exactly. Uh, some established brands are already using OneDot um, in different segments. So of course, uh, if you if you think this, uh, this might be very valuable for you, um, please let me know. Okay, how do you actually measure the impact of good content? Yeah, I think it's a it's a tricky. I hope everybody can read here in in the chat. Yeah, how how do you measure the impact of good content? Um, I mean, it's it's like uh, when you're uh, doing an experiment and you need to understand uh, um, if you're tuning some parameters. I think it's important that you don't change too much. I mean, first of all, I think it's complex. Yeah. <laughs> But if you want to measure it, then try to measure it um, A-B testing and you only change the variable you really want to test. 
So if you want to test what is the impact of a description, then try to A-B test this with actually with, with good content, with low content, maybe the same product when you know exactly that on Tuesday and Wednesday, um, um, they are always about the same amount of people buying this product. Um, but of course, if you change too many things, then it will be hard for you to understand was it the image, was it the text, was it the layout. Um, so, so try to, to really narrow it down. Um, think about external factors, as I've seen, the, the, sun, the sunshine and the sun cream. And then I think you should be able, um, if you do this multiple times, um, you will get some, some, some feedback. There. Does this answer your uh, questions, Detlef Pachelhofer? Otherwise, uh, let me know again. Okay, that's fine. You can just see that we have six minutes left of battery power, so you better hurry up with the questions. <laughs> and let me scroll in the in the window if I have overseen something. So far, so good. Yeah, otherwise, of course. Otherwise, of course, yeah, feel free to reach out again to me, right, or go to the booth um, or just write me an email. Happy to give feedback to your specific setup. Yeah.